Medtronic Technologies impacted more than 72 million people in the last year, equating to two people every second. Harnessing the power of technology to take healthcare further, each technology has unique benefits designed to serve patients. The goal of this program is to get closer to the patient and to delve into the challenges and impact each technology has in practice. This is the Medtronic MedEd learning experience. The BIS monitoring system should not be used as the sole basis for diagnosis or therapy and is intended only as an adjunct in patient assessment. Reliance on BIS system alone for intraoperative anesthetic management is not recommended. Medtronic's medical education programs are offered to provide attendees education on the FDA-cleared indications and use of our products when applicable. The contents and conclusions of the following program are solely those of the speakers unless otherwise cited. The speakers are responsible for all content and any necessary permissions. The speakers received funding from Covidian LP, a Medtronic company, for the speaking engagement. For this segment of the series, a discussion on anesthesia in the brain, we will dive into what spectral edge frequency is. To help us answer this question is Dr. Bob Thiele, Assistant Professor and Co-Director Enhanced Recovery After Surgery Program at the University of Virginia. Spectral edge frequency is something else I talked about when at the BIS display screen. That is the frequency below which most of the power is contained. And you can pick or cut off you want. Typically it's 90%. So the spectral edge frequency, you can, you can think of it as if you plot the, a waveform in a frequency domain, where's the cutoff where 90% of the power occurs? And this example on the bottom right, it's at about, 17 hertz. Most of the area under the curve, 90% of the area on the curve exists below 17 hertz. As that EEG waveform changes and it gets more high or low frequency power, that spectral edge frequency will change. Okay, so what does this actually mean? <laughs> These spectral patterns, this compressed spectral array that display frequency, intensity over time, can actually give you information about the anesthesia or sedation you're providing. And certain and patterns emerge depending on what anesthetic agents are using and how effective they are. So this, uh, this first on the top is called delta dominant slow wave anesthesia. And this is a signature that is typically seen in patients who are anesthetized. So we talked about earlier, delta waves are kind of what we think of as low frequency waves. And you see here, that in this compressed spectral array, that there's a lot of intensity at around five hertz, and even a lot more really bright red at about one hertz. So those are low frequency waves. And if you look at the actual raw waveform to the right of that, you see that there's some pretty high amplitude, low frequency waves. Another common pattern that you might see is what's called alpha dominant slow wave anesthesia. And now you have the appearance of alpha waves, which occur between, well, under anesthesia, an alpha wave is classified between seven and 17 hertz. So you notice now in the second figure that there's this bright red band at around 15 to 17 hertz that didn't exist in the waveform above it. And that's the alpha wave. And if you actually look at the raw EEG tracing, you could see it looks different and there's a lot more amplitude with with these really squiggly high frequency waveforms. Non-slow wave anesthesia is different than delta and alpha dominant slow wave anesthesia that really don't see any activity at these low frequencies. So there's no red on this compressed spectral array on this third image. There's not a lot of intensity there. And actually, if you look at the raw waveform to the right of it, you see there's not a lot of EEG movement at all. Not a lot of squiggly lines either at five hertz or 15 hertz. Birth suppression is a concept that I think is increasingly on everyone's mind as we think about the potential downside of over anesthetizing our patients. And what birth suppression is, is when you have periods of time where you basically have a flat EEG tracing. So there's no waveform at all, it's not going up and down. And that just looks like blue in the compressed spectral array because there's no power at any frequency. And so in patients that are experiencing birth suppression, you have periods of time where the screen on the compressed spectral array is all blue. And then you get some waveform activity. And then it goes back to blue and back and forth. And you can see that. 
on this compressed spectral array on the bottom there. So this is some nice data from Paul Garcia's lab at, with the Emory and now he's at Columbia that really shows that how some of the medications we use under provision of general anesthesia can actually impact these uh, compressed spectral arrays or these process EEG waveforms. And this is on the top, what you see is the appearance of alpha waves really that are correlated with the use of uh, opioids in patients under channel anesthesia. And so one of the sort of patterns that emerges here is that under what people sort of typically call balanced anesthesia, so the use of a general anesthetic like sevoflurane and the addition of an uh, anti-nociceptive agent like an opioid, you get the emergence of these alpha waves. And this is another uh, group. This is actually Emory Brown. And if you're going to read more about process EEG and how the brain works, this is the person, this is the place to start. You could look him up on YouTube and his TED Talks. He's absolutely amazing communicator and very entertaining and really breaks things down in ways that are easy to understand. And his life's work is on understanding the concept of consciousness and how it relates to anesthesia. He's an anesthesiologist. And so he's done this work where he takes um, volunteers and he puts them on a propofol infusion and measures when you lose consciousness based on your ability to respond to verbal cues and also clicking sound. So the first thing that goes is your response to clicks. You start ignoring it and then you start ignoring the people that are talking to you and then you've lost consciousness. And then you turn the propofol off and then first you start responding to voice and then clicks and then using this sort of algorithm and while measuring EEG start to really define what consciousness looks like under anesthesia. And so this is that compressed spectral array that I talked about. Again, it's also that's available on a lot of process EEG monitors. So at 30 minutes prior to consciousness, uh, very leftmost part of this graph, you see no alpha activity. And then as the patient progresses, as the propofol started and they start to become drowsy, you see this sort of activity starting between 15 and 25 hertz and at loss of consciousness, it really coalesces into this bright red waveform activity at about 15 hertz, that's the alpha band. And that's signifying this patient that they lost consciousness. And when they get a little bit deeper, what you start to see is actually some really low frequency waves around two hertz. And we talked earlier about these delta dominant slow wave anesthesia. And that's visualized here. You can't see it really well. But this next sort of schematic that was produced by Dr. Brown's lab kind of really shows what happens with a propofol, pure propofol anesthetic. And the appearance of these um, alpha waves and, this, and, the, and the spectral edge that we talked about as you go under anesthesia. So the spectral edge starts out at higher frequencies, like at these gamma frequencies around 30 Hertz. And as you get an deeper and deeper anesthetized, the spectral edge frequency gets, actually gets lower. And then as you wake up, the spectral edge frequency goes back to 30 Hertz.